In this second quantitative trades lecture, we'll develop the central idea in this subject, which is that of the heritability, which really does um, most of the important work. The variance of a trait measured in some units, x, is of course just the average squared deviation of all the values of x in the population from it x's mean. In other words, the phenotypic variance in the notation we use in um, quantitative genetics, v sub p, is just the average um, squared difference of all the x's from m sub x, their mean. This total phenotypic variance can then be partitioned into components in a very useful way. That was Fisher's um, ginormous insight published um, just slightly over 100 years ago. The first split is that between the genetic and environmental variance components. That is to say, V sub P, the number that is this average squared deviation of all the trait values from their mean, is literally mathematically equal to V sub G, the contribution to that variance of genetic differences, and V sub E, the contribution to that phenotypic variance of environmental influences on the expression of the trait values. The genetic variance then needs to be further subdivided, at least into the additive and non-additive genetic um, contributions, um, conventionally denoted V sub A for the additive component of the genetic variance, V sub D for the um, variance contributed by dominance interactions of alleles at the same loci, and V sub I, the so-called interaction variance um, that is contributed by epistatic interactions between genotypes at different loci in the genome. Um, it's a fact that V sub I is harder to estimate and also fortunately um, usually not very large. So um, the, the important split within the genetic variance is that between the additive and the dominance component, which will be most of the non-additive part. Then the broad sense heritability is defined as the fraction that's genetic in all these senses. That is, it's just V sub G um, over V sub E, sorry, V sub P. That is the fraction of the total phenotypic variance, what we see when we just look at the organisms. Um, the fraction that is um, determined by genes or contributed by genes in this sense is um, capital H squared is the traditional way of denoting it, the broad sense heritability. And it's not heritability squared, it's just the heritability. Someone put the superscript 2 in there long ago to remind us that we're talking about variances. So it's just a, it's just a, a long habit of writing the heritability as h squared. The narrow sense heritability is the more important one for most purposes. It's the fraction that is additive genetic, so just VA over VP, um, excluding the dominance and interaction and other non-additive contributions to the genetic variance. It's written little h squared, and it's the one that does the useful work for us. That's because little h squared determines both the resemblance of offspring to their parents and the population's evolutionary response to selection acting on the trait, whether artificial selection in an agricultural context or natural selection out in the wild. Uh, and those, it turns out, are really the same thing. And that's one of the big and subtle ideas um, that I hope you get um, out of this um, lecture and your further study of this fascinating and important subject. So how can we estimate little h squared? Well, the easy way is to notice that it is the regression, that is the slope, 
of offspring phenotypic values on parental values. Um, and these textbook illustrations show how it goes. If when we um, make a, a, a spotogram of offspring uh, traits, let's say heights on the y-axis and parents on the x-axis, if we just get kind of a shotgun blast with a very shallow regression slope, I hope you can see these very faint hairline um, gray lines, which should be darker but aren't. Um, anyway, that's the heritability quite small, near zero. This would be a moderate heritability. We can predict something about the offspring heights from knowing the parents. And then a very high heritability approaching one would look like this, where most of the variation in the offspring um, can be explained by variation in, the, in their very parents. Remember the definition of a, a regression coefficient, the slope, often written b sub yx for the slope of y on x, um, is estimated as, actually defined as, the covariance between x and y, and the variance of x. So it's over the variance of the parental values, not um, both of them. Um, in, as, in a sexual species like ours, um, where we're trying to estimate the heritability from literally these um, measurements, x would be the mid-parent value, which is to say just the average of mom's and dad's phenotypic values, x, on the x-axis, and y is are the values of individual offspring. Um, Gillespie's table 6.2 should be consulted here um, to make all this completely clear. Um, and so then that under that um, condition, the slope is an estimate of the narrow sense heritability, and of course the higher it is, the better offspring resemble their parents. So, um, to put it the other way around, the higher the heritability, the better the offspring trait values are predicted by the parental trait values. And that's the connection with selection. In the agricultural context, which is what Fisher was working in largely when he came up with all this, um, people practiced truncation selection. You have some uh, normal distribution of an economically important uh, trait. Say you're trying to increase that value, which is related to yield, perhaps, somehow. Um, a thing to do in those days was to um, pick some cutoff, alpha, a minimum trait value um, above which you would include members of the parental generation as breeders and below which you wouldn't breed from them. Then S, the selection differential, um, is defined as the mean of all the selected parents, that is the mean of these individuals in the upper tail of the distribution, um, minus the mean of the population they came from. All right, so this S is how much um, bigger the mean of the selected breeding parents is compared to the um, mean of the population as a whole. The response to selection is then the difference between the mean of the resulting offspring population and the original parental population. So it's the amount by which we moved um, the mean of this population by performing selection. S is called the selection differential, and um, R is the response to selection, and this movement that the breeders were well aware of, of that is this, this um, tendency of the response to be disappointingly less than the selection differential, is why the regression slope ended up being called a regression. You may have wondered what's regressive about it. Um, the answer is only this sort of um, very old-fashioned um, notion of offspring population regressing back toward the mean of the original parental population. Um, 
there is a geometric interpretation of the um, parent offspring regressions, uh, sorry, the parent offspring phenotypes and the regression slope through them that if you study it makes clear um, why the heritability can also be estimated as um, the response over the selection. That is the, the ratio of the movement of the population mean um, to the strength of selection as quantified by S. And again, this is another uh, textbook illustration that is a, a brave and partly successful attempt to make this idea clear. It shows midparent values and offspring values for tail length in some hypothetical mice. We do a selection on them where we only breed from parents with tails of around 10 centimeters or longer, the ones in red. And we move, thereby move the population mean this amount the difference between O bar and O star um, on a selection differential, um, which is P star mi minus P bar. And um, that slope is equal to H squared. And um, it's true that the result is then equal to H squared times S. So the narrow sense heritability was immediately understood to be important by breeders because it is, it predicts the extent, it, repick, it predicts the size of the response that as a breeder you will get for selection of a given strength on a trait in that population. And um, it is um, the additive variance that is the part that accounts for the resemblance of the offspring to their parents and thereby, right in the very same way, um, accounts for the response to selection. So let's do an example. The most famous um, of all, what's the heritability of height in humans? Um, here's, I think you've seen this living histogram of evolution students before, um, demonstrating variation in um, human height um, in feet and inches. Um, Scott Freeman and John Heron did um, an experiment in their ev evolution course at the University of Washington a number of years ago, similar to what Gillespie did in his at Davis. Um, they asked the students to measure themselves and their parents, and here's their um, data set, somewhat larger sample. And again, you can probably barely see this faint um, regression line shot through all those points. It has a slope of 0.84, estimating the heritability as up around 84%, um, a typical value for relatively homogeneous populations with really good nutrition and health care. Um, this means 84% of the total variance in height is additive genetic, right? Um, VA over VP, the, right, the fraction that is of the total phenotypic variance that you see that is additive genetic is about um, 84%. A few years ago, I made up um, this kooky example to make the point that the heritability of genotypes is exactly 1.0. Um, it um, was made by um, taking our then data set of 30 Utah HapMap families and picking one locus at random from each of eight chromosomes, just to make it fit on a slide. So the chromosomes are these columns. Um, the genotypes are coded 0, 1, 2 in the usual sort of scheme. Um, the second allele, um, it's, it's the number of copies of the second allele, or one of them anyway. Um, each row is a family. Here are 30 families, 0 through 29. Um, and the columns of numbers within each group for a chromosome, for a locus, are moms, dads, and their child's genotypes. So this, in this first case, um, family zero, chromosome one, um, mother and father are both heterozygotes. They have a one, and the child got it was a two. Uh, it got, in fact, that allele from both parents and, and was was therefore a homozygote for the allele 
um, being counted by the genotype scores. All right, then the sum of all the genotype scores, which we can think of as plus making alleles um, for this purpose, is shown in the last column, adding up over all eight loci. Here are the totals of the hypothetically plus making alleles in mother, father, and offspring and child. Um, I then made scatter plots in this text base uh, manner um, for each of the loci. So here in this box is the locus on chromosome one. Turns out it's an AC um, polymorphism at that position on chromosome one. Um, the offspring have um, values of zero, one, and two, since they either have zero, one, or two copies of the plus making allele. The midparent genotypes are, can be zero, a half, one, one and a half, or two, because they are the average of two parents, both of whom are diploid. So for this locus, you can, your eye tells you, yes, there's a positive relationship. Um, the correlation is 0.41, the regression is 0.57. And here's the second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. They're all variations on the same theme with, of course, um, somewhat different um, correlations and regressions given the small size of the sample. Um, you'll notice that the regressions are all greater than the correlations. That's because the variance of the parental, mid that is the midparent values, X, um, is less than the variance of the offspring values because of the averaging of two randomly um, chosen parents. Gillespie again explains this in table 6.2. Here's the seventh and the eighth locus, uh, typical of the others, and then here's the scatter plot for the summed scores for all eight loci together, where the scores range from 6 to 11. And here, the regression slope is satisfyingly close to 1.0, which is its theoretically predicted value. Um, the correlation, 0.65, is a bit lower than the theoretically expected correlation, which is 1 over the square root of 2, or 0.71, but still close enough um, for a small data set like this one. Now, what about the variation induced by environmental factors? Even clones and identical twins differ from each other, of course. Um, here are cuttings of Achillea, Yarrow, that were grown at different elevations in California, uh, but places where the species normally occurs. So identical genotype, look at the differences in height of typical stems at Stanford, at near sea level, Mather in the Sierra foothills, 4,600 feet, and Treeline, 10,000 feet, where they can sort of survive, but barely, right? A huge effect of the environment on the size of the plant. Edward East, Nicotiana plants, um, the study of flower height in them, um, growing in the same garden plots, um, the uh, two parents, homozygous short flowered parents and homozygous tall flowered parents, genetically uniform, but they still have some variation in, um, in flower height, even though uh, the distributions don't overlap for the inbred parents. The F1s are satisfyingly intermediate in height, but genetically identical among themselves, all of them heterozygous at any site where the two parents did, uh, are fixed for different alleles, um, and they also have environmental variation. And here are leaves from my um, uh, undergraduate courses, um, study, long-term study of um, quaking aspen, um, two trees, two leaves from each of two trees from one clone growing at the top of Mill Creek Canyon. Um, they're very similar to each other, but not identical. Every trait you think of involving size, shape, serration of the edges, number and placement of veins, whatever. Um, they all do vary somewhat, even though the genotypes are identical for all four leaves. Okay, so the total phenotypic variance is the genetic plus the environmental parts. And what you see, the phenotypic variance, is what arises from these two distinct sources, 
and they have to be separated. Um, the genetic variance is that among phenotypes caused by genotypic differences among individuals, holding environments constant. We're coming back around over this in order to try to cement this idea that we're not talking about the variance of genes in this context. The genetic variance is a variance of phenotypes, which is caused by genes, or more precisely, by uh, genotypic differences among the individuals. And it is conceived and estimated in a way that ideally gives us a number that would apply if we could hold environments constant. It's intended, at least, to be the effect of genes, not the environment, on the variance, on the total variance. Symmetrically and similarly, the environmental variance is not the variance of the environment. It's the variance of the phenotypes, which is caused by differences in the experiences that individuals had as they were developing and um, expressing their phenotypes, conceptually holding genotypes constant, right? So it's, so that's, so these are completely symmetrical, um, um, other things being equal definitions of contributions to the phenotypic variants. Here's um, a made up example that I hope helps get this idea across and make it, uh, the, the point of this is to make it intuitive um, for you that the environmental variance gets added onto the genetic variance to produce um, the total phenotypic variance. And in fact, we're, we're going to work it that way, starting with the genetic variance and adding on environmental variance. But I just should point out, you could do it the other way around. We could start with the environmental variance and add on the genetic variance and get the same result, which would make the same kind of sense. Anyway, here's how the this little model goes. We suppose um, we have a trait um, controlled by um, alleles at a single locus, the A locus, and the values of the big A homozygotes, the heterozygotes, and the little a homozygotes are minus one, zero, and plus one units on our scale of some kind. These numbers, of course, being chosen for simplicity to make the mean be zero, because P and Q, the allele frequencies, are both equal to one. So we have a one to two to one Mendelian ratio of genotypes. There are the genotypes underneath these bars. Here are the trait values, minus one, zero, and plus one. And here are the frequencies, 25, 50, and 25%. OK. So the genetic variance, the average squared deviation of these um, genetically determined trait values, from the population mean is easily, even in our heads, computed to be 0.5. And that's because the mean is zero, half the individuals have phenotypes of zero, so they're contributing nothing to the invariance, to the variance. The other half of the individuals are plus or minus one unit. Square that, it's one unit squared. Half of them are ones, half of them are zeros, so the average of that is a half. OK, now we add on the environmental variance. Suppose a quarter of each genotype then deviates one unit above or below its average trait value because of just something in the environment that individuals happen to experience randomly. So for these big A, big A homozygotes with an expected um, phenotype of minus one, we would then get a quarter of them moved to minus two. They're still big A, big A individuals. A uh, half of them would remain at minus one. A quarter of them would get bumped up by the environment to um, one step higher, which is a phenotypic value of zero. They're still big A, big A. All right, so this is, in the red box, is the environmental smearing of the trait values of this particular genotype, right? So this variance is V sub E, 
this is the environmental variance that's layered on top of this um, genotypic value. Okay, so obviously because this is the same, 1 to 2 to 1 distribution with a spread of minus 1, 0, and plus 1 from its mean, the environmental variance is also conveniently exactly a half. That predicts on our um, Fisherian um, summation that the resulting phenotypic variance should be a half plus a half, which is 1 exactly, and it is. The, uh, the bottom uh, portion of the figure shows what you get when you apply this environmental smearing to all three of the genotypes and then add up the resulting phenotypes. You get this distribution from minus 2 to plus 2 and um, trivial to calculate the exact proportions and you can confirm for yourself the phenotypic variance is exactly 1.0 and this shows uh, which are the genotypes that are contributing to each of the phenotypic values. So the ones in the middle um, come from all three genotypes. Um, the ones more extremely below are enriched for big A, but they're not entirely um, big A alleles. And conversely, the ones with elevated phenotypes are enriched for the little a allele, but they're a mix of both. All right, so um, here again is the syllogism, right? VP is VG plus VE. We've just demonstrated that here on this slide. Um, then the VG, um, to repeat what we said earlier, can be subdivided into the additive dominance and interaction components. Um, that plus VE is the most important four-way uh, partitioning of the total phenotypic variance. And the heritability is, as we've been arguing, the fraction of VP that is additive genetic. Um, let's stop here, take a break, and come back um, to develop the um, reality and significance of the non-additive genetic variance in the last part of the lecture.